While the devastation of Pompeii is dramatic and traumatic, it only represents one type of eruption. When we look at eruptive styles and landforms, we can talk about central eruptions, eruptions that essentially come from the main pipe, the main conduit from the magma chamber to the surface. We can talk about shield volcanoes like Hawaii. These are the large, quiet eruptions. These are the kind of eruptions, unlike Pompeii, where people were killed as they were running away. In many Hawaiian eruptions, people know weeks or even months in advance that it's time to move out of your house or get to higher ground because the lava is coming down the road. It'll be there at the end of the month. So plenty of time. And the reason there's plenty of time is these are quiet eruptions. The magma is very hot when it reaches the surface. The lava that flows across the surface is on the order of 1200 degrees centigrade. So very fluid. We have volcanic domes that generally result from more explosive eruptions. Cinder cones, minor eruptions. These are composed predominantly of pyroclasts. Stratovolcanoes, these are the ones we all recognize as that's a volcano. And then volcanic craters, we'll talk about those, their significance and dimensions. And calderas, the big ones. And then diatremes, the most explosive ones, when material can reach supersonic speed. So here we have the shield volcano of Mauna Loa, again, the largest mountain in the world. If you go from the base of the Pacific Ocean to the top of the volcano where the meteorological station is located, this is Mauna Kea in the background. It's about the same height as Mauna Loa. These are both on the big island. Now with these volcanoes, we have a central vent, we have side vents. All of these can be active at the same time or different times. And the result is we have a very broad plain of basalt spreads out over the Pacific floor. Volcanic domes like Mount St. Helens are the result of a piling up of viscous felsic lavas. And as the pressure builds, this causes a bulging outward of the mountain. And as we saw with Mount St. Helens, when one side collapsed, the eruption went literally sideways. Cinder cone volcanoes are made up of piles of pyroclastic debris. This eruption of Cerro Negro in 1968 built a cinder cone on top of an older lava flow. This is in Nicaragua. One of the coolest volcanoes I've seen is uh, the big one in uh, Lago de Nicaragua near uh, Rio de Tigre where we're doing some sampling. Kind of like a big volcano sticking out of a coffee colored lake something primeval. And one of the questions that people ask is how do volcanoes start? Has anyone ever seen a volcano from the beginning of its life to maturity? The answer is yeah. And uh, this is from Mexico, southern Mexico, a man named Dionisio Polito. This is a direct quote from him in English. At 4 p.m. I left my wife to set fire to a pile of branches when I noticed that a crack which had been situated on one of the knolls of my farm had opened, and I saw that it was a kind of fissure that had a depth of only a half a meter. I set about to ignite the branches again when I felt a thunder. The trees trembled, and I turned to speak to Paula, his wife, and it was then that I saw how, in the hole, the ground had swelled and raised itself two or two and a half meters high, and a kind of smoke or fine dust, gray, like ashes, began to rise up in a portion of the crack that I had not previously seen. Immediately more smoke began to rise with a hiss or whistle, loud and continuous, and there was a smell of sulfur. So this is the eruption that started in 1943. It went on until 1952. And during the eruption, the Strombolian pyroclastic activity that began at the fissure, in 24 hours, the eruption had generated a 50 meter high scoria cone. The scoria is a very vesicular kind of volcanic rock. You see it outside of Burger Kings and McDonald's because it's very light, light meaning you can pick up a big boulder of it because it's mostly air. So there's a 50 meter high pile of this after 24 hours. Within a week, the pile had grown to 100 meters from the accumulation of bombs in La Pile. Those are small fragments and finer fragments of ash that were raining down on the village of Peracutin. The eruption became more powerful in March, generating eruptive columns several kilometers high. Occasionally, the volcano would exhibit volcanian-type activity with large cannon-like explosions separated by short periods of silence. That's kind of like a religious parade in South America. They bang on these large logs to wake everybody up and fire cannons. It's a pretty noisy affair. On June 12th, a lobe of lava began to advance toward 
of Paracutin, and people evacuated the village the next day. The larger village of San Juan Paragaracutiro was evacuated a few months later. Sorry if you're from there and I mispronounced that. By August 1944, most of the villages of Paracutin and San Juan were covered in lava and ash. All that remained ultimately of San Juan were two church towers that stood above the lava deposit. The final height reached by the volcano was 424 meters. So literally this man, Dionisio, saw the volcano crack open the earth and rise to a height of 424 meters. Although things didn't end up pleasantly, at least he wasn't incinerated. When we talk about volcanoes, we think about volcanoes like this. Mount Fuji, Mount Kilimanjaro, these stratovolcanoes have a very characteristic look. And this is made up of a central pipe or a central vent that spews out a mixture of lava and pyroclastic debris. And these subsequent lava flows and pyroclastic debris will form the relatively steep slope that we see characteristic of these volcanoes. The lava flows themselves serve to stabilize the pyroclastic material and therefore keep it from weathering as well. So the reason this looks familiar is because we've decided this is what a volcano should look like. When we turn things up a couple notches, a couple big notches, we end up with a caldera. The most famous caldera in North America is probably Crater Lake, even though Yellowstone is also a caldera, in fact a bigger caldera. These result when there's a violent eruption that vacates the volcano's magma chamber. And because the magma chamber is now empty, it's no longer supporting the overlying material. So that material collapses, forming, in this case, a large lake. Now, this is located in Oregon in the US. It's one of the deepest lakes in North America, even though it's not particularly big. We can see the resurgence of the volcano here. Dude. Mellow. We can see the volcano resurging here in Wizard Island. And down here below, we have a much more spectacular caldera, pictured here from Panahakil. This is the caldera left behind that now is filled with water, forming Lago de Atitlan in Guatemala. Surrounding this caldera is a series of very large volcanoes. Each are spectacular in their own right. Aldous Huxley, a famous science fiction writer, wrote, Lake Como, it seems to me, touches on the limit of permissibly picturesque. That's a famous lake in Switzerland. But Atitlan is Como with additional embellishments of several immense volcanoes. It really is too much of a good thing. And here from this aerial photo, you can see the outline of the caldera here, which is now becoming filled in by several large volcanoes. There's a double volcanic peak here, another large volcano here. Those are seen in the background of that previous image. The lake fills a caldera that was generated about 84,000 years ago. It's 340 meters deep, and it's now generally considered to be one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. As you can see here, the double peak volcano and the single peak volcano located at the end of the dock in uh, Panakil. Going further south, we've seen this volcano earlier in the course, Deception Island, located right here. And from the air, it looks like this. Again, a donut with a bite taken out of it, passing through Neptune's bellows and into the interior of the caldera. This is the old whaling station. You can see the remains of the boilers here. And as I mentioned earlier, they give us a chance to go for a swim in the Southern Ocean, which is at a balmy minus one and a half degrees centigrade. So just summing this up for the time being, we have our shield volcano, broad, Volcano formed from gentle, long-lasting eruptions. Volcanic domes that form rapidly and violently. Cinder cone volcanoes, best exemplified by that volcano in Mexico. Stratovolcanoes, exemplified here by Mount Fuji. And caldera, exemplified by Crater Lake in Oregon. Taking a little bit closer look at how these calderas form, here we have Crater Lake positioned in the Cascades. This built up a volcano that looked most likely a lot like Mount Rainier today. The magma chamber fills and triggers a volcanic eruption, in this case a very violent eruption. As this eruption continues and material is released, it vacates the magma chamber. Once this magma chamber is vacated, it no longer supports the overlying material, 
and that material collapses into the magma chamber. Ultimately, if there's sufficient precipitation, the caldera may fill with water and generate a picturesque lake like Crater Lake in Oregon or Atitlan in Guatemala. And here are just a couple of visuals of Crater Lake. Now, Shiprock in New Mexico is an example of a diatreme. In this case, a diatreme is filled with gas charged magma. This magma comes from deep in the mantle. It works its way upward, breaking through the lithosphere and blasting through the lithosphere, carrying chunks of it and chunks of the mantle as it erupts at supersonic speed. Now, after the eruption, this channel is going to fill up with diatreme material made up of magma and rock fragments that are angular, so they're going to be a breccia. Ultimately, softer sediment of the cone and surface, that material is going to wear away, leaving the, the harder, more weather-resistant diatreme plumbing behind. Here we have an eruption in Guatemala, modern eruption in Guatemala. Another form of eruption can be that coming from linear cracks or fissures. These fissure eruptions can be quite massive and long-lasting. They can include flood basalts, and other eruptions from linear cracks include ash flow deposits. We'll start out with the Laki fissure eruption in Iceland. This is near Kirkjabæjar cluster in southern Iceland, and this is an overview of the, the fissure itself. And this is a photo that I took from about 20 kilometers away, seeing that the Land still hasn't recovered from an eruption that took place back in the 1780s. In this particular eruption, it lasted for eight months from 1873 to 1874, released 14 cubic kilometers or 3.4 cubic miles of basalt, along with clouds of poisonous hydrofluoric acid and sulfur dioxide compounds. These killed much of the livestock of Iceland, around 80%, and it led to a famine that's known as the Mist Hardships that killed about 25% of the humans on the island. So about 80% of the sheep were killed, 50% of the cattle and horses died from skeletal fluorosis. And this is caused by the 8 million tons of hydrogen fluoride that were released. This volcano, the global climate effect, it killed about 6 million people. It was this eruption and its global extent that led Benjamin Franklin, famous early US politician, general know-it-all, to speculate that volcanoes could influence global climate. Subsequently, there's been some speculation that while he was hanging around in France with some French scientists, maybe he overheard them, maybe he was involved in the discussions, but perhaps he just brought the idea to the English-speaking world first. Along the coast, we see the Torsaharan lava, which is the largest known Holocene flow on Earth. The volume is about 25 cubic kilometers or six cubic miles. And it's also known for the development of what's called beach peat. This is a kind of soft, spongy feeling pile of vegetation. This is all that has been generated in the almost 9,000 years since the eruption. So when you walk on this, it's sort of like walking on a couch or a bunch of pillows. But underneath is some really jagged stuff. So how does this happen? Well, in Iceland, it's pretty easy to see. Iceland's peeling apart. It's part of the Mid-Ocean Ridge, so it's being ripped to pieces. And as it's being pulled apart, these fissures appear, these cracks, and because there's mantle material sitting below, it's going to work its way up through these fissures to be expressed on the surface in a highly fluid basaltic eruption. Also, it's a great conduit for poisonous volcanic gases. Closer to home in central to southern Washington, northern Oregon, we have the Columbia River flood basalts. And along the Columbia River, you can see the sequence of basaltic lava flows here. What this represents is the passage of the hot spot beneath North America, also the subduction of a spreading center in the Farallon Plate. So we actually subducted a spreading center beneath North America, resulting in this huge outflow of basalts. The interaction between volcanoes and other geosystems include volcanoes and the hydrosphere, such as in the case of fumaroles and geysers, volcanism and the atmosphere, in the case of aerosols and ash. And starting out with a very dangerous place, one of the worst jobs on earth is recovering elemental sulfur from fumaroles in Indonesia. People generally only last around six months to a year on this job. So climb up the volcano, break off chunks of this elemental sulfur, and backpack it down for sale. It's 
almost worthless. Almost. This is the location of Geysir, where all geysers get their names. Tourist ring in, in southwestern Iceland. So I was kind of excited to see the Geysir erupt. And it was pretty spectacularly disappointing. So about oh, 8 to 10 meters high. And lasts about 5 minutes. Attracts big crowds. And then everyone hops back into their monster trucks and drives onto the glacier. Old Faithful, by comparison, much larger. This is about the height of Geysir here. So you can see it's about four or five times the, the height, the eruptive height of Geysir in Iceland. We see these features in specific places in the world. They generally, almost exclusively, coincide with plate boundaries. We have the Ring of Fire around the Pacific. We have the occasional volcanoes out in the middle of plates that are hotspot related. So Hawaii being the most famous here. Uh, we talked about the volcano of Paracotin down here in Mexico. Mount St. Helens is located here. Lassen located here. Mount Rainier right by Seattle. Some other big ones we've talked about include Kilauea. We have talked about Mount Pinatubo here in the Philippines. Tambora, we will be talking about. Krakatoa, we mentioned. Kilimanjaro, we mentioned. And Vesuvius, here we mentioned. Stromboli, we sort of hinted at because of its type of eruption, explosive Strombolian eruption. And we mentioned briefly the volcanic activity here in Kamchatka, as well as Laki in Iceland and Hekla, and then Deception Island down here. Global patterns of volcanism include a mapping of basalt producing spreading centers, a mantle source for the lava, decompression melting. As pressure is relieved, melting can commence without a change in temperature. Axial volcanoes related to mid-ocean ridges. You can see that summed up here in this diagram. Starting in the upper left, at ocean-ocean convergent boundaries, magmas originated from partial melting of the mantle give rise to volcanic island arcs erupting mostly basaltic lavas. So think Aleutians, think Philippines, think Japan. Those are island arcs. At mid-ocean ridges, we're going to see fissure-type eruptions, like those of Iceland. On the, along the continents, ocean continent convergent boundaries are mixtures of basalts coming from the mantle and remelted felsic continental crust that gets incorporated into the mantle magma melt. These materials that are melted off the top of the subducted plate. So these are going to give rise to volcanoes with intermediate compositions and acidic lavas, so gray rock. Black rock in the island arc, gray rock in the continental volcanic belts. In the continental crust, we often have felsic lavas, rhyolites, very explosive eruptions like that of Yellowstone. Now, volcanism related to subduction zones includes chains of volcanoes, island arcs, formation of new continental crust, whereas interplate volcanism includes the mantle plume hypothesis, the formation of Yellowstone, the formation of the Hawaiian Islands that are generated relative to hot spots and mantle plumes, Sea mounts and island chains can result from this activity. Once the islands have reached their maximum vertical extent and the volcano is extinct, they begin to wear down. And we can generate large igneous provinces, things like the Columbia River flood basalts, the Deccan traps in India, and the Permian traps in Siberia. We've covered this earlier. We'll just go through it quickly here. The Pacific Plate has been moving northwest over the Hawaiian hotspot. So the older volcanoes are going to be located up here. These again are ophiolites that are 98 to 100 or so million years of age, moving south the Emperor Seamount chain until we get to around 30 million years ago, 28.5 or so. And we make a sharp turn. And ultimately, everything from here to here grades from 30 million years ago to the present. And you can see that a little more better expressed here, I guess. And we've talked about this, the Yellowstone volcanic track. So we see the movement of the hot spot 
as a series of volcanic events across southern Idaho and up into Wyoming. Around the world, large igneous provinces. You mentioned some of these a minute ago. The Columbia River basalts here. The Siberian traps here. The Deccan traps here. Now it's important to note that some of these, like the Siberian traps, coincide with mass extinction events. The Permian extinction is the same time that these traps were erupted. The Cretaceous extinction occurred at the same time these volcanics were erupted. Coincidence? Probably not. 